Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Loom Poetry in Harrisville, or in this case, in wherever you are. Um, our series has been graciously co-hosted by our wonderful bookstore, Toadstool. And um, you can, of course, buy books by the authors. Um, uh, the same place that you went to to register, if you go a little lower, there are their books and you can purchase them from Toadstool. Um, um, this, our, this reading of Dee Dee and Major Jackson was originally scheduled last April, right when their new books came out. And so we've waited for a whole year for this to finally happen um, virtually. Uh, I'll be introducing each poet um, individually and they'll read for about 20 minutes. Elise, as she mentioned, will monitor the chat if you want to um, bring up anything you'd like them to talk about afterwards, or you can just raise your hand and wiggle around until I see you and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself after they've finished reading. Um, so I'm really glad to see you, by the way. Um, Dee Dee Jackson's Moon Jar uh, was a finalist for the Alice James Book Award, the Lexi Rudnitsky Book Award, and the Autumn House Book Award before it was published by Red Hen in 2020. Her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, the New England Review, Kenyon Review, and Plowshares, among other journals and magazines. Her chapbook, Slag and Fortune was published by Floating Wolf Quarterly, and she's had poems in Best American Poetry, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day, The Slowdown with Tracy K. Smith, and most recently, Together in Sudden Strangeness, po po America's Poets Respond to the Pandemic. She serves as a contributing editor for Green Mountains Review and currently teaches creative writing at Vanderbilt University. I was struck in a recent rereading of Dee Dee's book, Moon Jar, by the artistry in the shaping of the whole book. Like a painter, and Dee Dee has taught art history, Dee Dee works with a number of elements that are presented, echoed, refigured, recognized, and estranged to create the canvas of a whole book. To name just a few, well, I'm saying just a few, but I'm gonna name a lot. Um, her first husband's suicide, knives, the moon, time, painting and painters, birds, pine trees, mountains, crystal and diamonds, color, like yellow, black, blue, white, skin, sleeplessness, and the severing and joining all flicker through the book to its concluding redemptive wisdom. So we've been well guided when we arrive at the notion in the final poem that living is never a perfect sphere, but is the color of everything in the winter night. The poem I'm gonna read is the last poem in her book, it's called Moon Jar. And it includes a lot of those elements which you will probably hear in other poems she reads. Moon jar. My wedding ring is missing, one small diamond. And I like it that way, a reminder of the imperfect in all of us, that keyhole size of grief that remains crystalline. In Korea, ceramicists for centuries have made moon jars testimony to the virtue of modesty a symmetrical warping on the wheel, slumping in the pine-heated kiln, impurities when fired, black dots and pox on the surface like freckles on the skin. I have been kept awake so many nights by the moon, its pull on the pines and night birds and who, like a monk, keeps a sharp order of time. Never a perfect sphere, the milky moon jar joins two clay hemispheres into one. When the light of the moon finds me, I am the color of everything in the winter night. Dee Dee. Thank you. And what a lovely reading of my poem. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you for hosting tonight. Um, thank you, Elise, for also being behind that 
um, icon, the toadstool icon. <laughs> um, and um, and for the toadstool, toadstool bookstore, it's a mouthful, um, for hosting and the Loom uh, reading series, which is wonderful. And uh, there's so many familiar faces that I'm really happy to see, um, or names, because sometimes I don't see the face, right? And um, it's wonderful. I see Kristen and Stephanie, and I think I see and Meg um, and Lisa Kruger. Good to see you, um, or see your name anyway. So, and everyone else, anyone else that I'm missing, I'm sorry, because I'm just looking through names really quick. and. Um, I had to change my name actually because my name was like a just like a, just a Jack Jack DL for a long time and I don't know I wasn't, I'm not, he's not Jack you know anyway so good to see everybody um, so I'm going to read uh, the first half of what I'll read I'll read um, from my book Moonjar and then I'm going to read some new poems and I'm going to end on a very very new poem very like within a week or so that I've written it um, I like to do that and the other thing is. Um, I tried to curate some spring poems because I think we're all really excited for spring to, to be here. Um, and I'm in Nashville right now, um, recently moved here in the fall. Um, and so spring came sooner than it had for me in Vermont for all the, for many years. <laughs> but I remember being in Vermont and so super excited. Although I know that it's still gonna snow again in May probably. And that's my, it's a joke, but not a joke. Um, that's in the first poem that I'll read, so. Um, so my first poem is Signs for the Living. Sometimes after the last snow in May, after the red-winged blackbird clutches the spine of the cattail, after he leans forward, droops his wings and flashes his epaulets, I imagine shouldering the yellow center lines of the road. Near the recently thawed pond within a long channel of construction, a man holding a sign. One side says slow, the other stop. Joy and sorrow always run like parallel lines. Inside the house when I leave the lights on, small white moths come like a collection of worship, pulsing their wings up and up the window as if in a frenzied trance-like dance. Some dervishes others the penitent on shaky knees. The first few years after my husband's suicide, I wanted to be the penitent. I thought I deserved all the pain I could feel. The drill of roadwork in late summer was a welcome grinding music. Now the yellow center lines are flung like braids behind me. Honing. A sharp knife is a safe knife. There is a difference between honing a knife and sharpening it. The metal rod that stands in the center of my knife block only hones. I can hone my skills, perfect them over time. I might hone granite, hone my French, hone rock climbing and love making. When I sharpen an edge, I grind away at the metal blade. The stainless steel burrs become smooth like a trained voice or like following the rules. But after his suicide, I collected all the blades from the kitchen. I admired the heft of the chef's knife, the balance of the tang. It only takes a 20 degree angle to sharpen the length of a blade. The day he died, I sliced a loaf of bread, some cheese to sit out, waiting for return never to come. Where did I think all the blood came from? To hone is to recenter the blade. To sharpen is to animate the wind. Directions for my son on his birthday. I cup my hands to hold your youth. I try to show you how to do the same. It takes decades of practice to get this right. And by then it is always too late. Yesterday, a man stabbed a homeless man on Church Street. At dinner, we tucked the story between bites of salmon, pieces of song by Fleetwood Mac melting from the speaker. It rained all day today. I told you 
that I always thought I'd have another baby. In truth, I knew I was only good for one. No matter how hard you press the outer edges of your palms and pinkies together, they will always leak. You should know that you can't hold water in your palm for long. Don't put yourself in a spot where you'll have to carry all you will need. At dusk, we count four rabbits on the back lawn and I consider if it is a sign only to watch the stocking feral tabby turn them to humble bronze, heavy and frozen and hopefully downwind. At least once a year, you should close your cupped hands like a book. Not to worry, hinged, they always open again. Slip. The cat slips out the window. The thread slips past the eye. The sun slips into the stratus. The letter S slips past my tongue. The lead slips beyond the drop of the Y. A steel pyramid slipped in and out of a utility knife. The blade slipped into the skin on his wrist and neck. The whisper song of J's slips from beak to beak, tree to tree. He slipped down the bathroom wall. I slip on ice I do not see. The temperature slips below zero. Our photo slips from its place in the frame. The river slips past the stormed down tree. I slipped on a wedge of light to enter the morgue. I let it slip. Suicide. The blooms of the lilac slip into a purple and white parade. At the end of the day, I slip out of my body. Um, the first section of my book is uh, really um, about me coming to terms and surviving suicide loss. And the second section, the middle section, is um, a little grouping of poems of when I was in Greece. So after, after I lost my husband, I was fortunate enough to go and um, be on a Greek island. And, I, and I, it just seemed, it's so mythic in itself. And then for me and this need to kind of rediscover myself and re recalibrate who I was going to be in my new world, in my new world. Um, and so I'll read one of those poems. It's titled Figure of a Woman. It could have been the crescendo of summer, the ebb and flow of your voice, the squid boats rocking in the Bay of Lavadi, sweet Rocca Milo on your lips. Always when love comes hard, how it can fall. The waves in the bay were like tongues searching for an open mouth. What did I know of your needs and of mine? Now you have set the clock backwards and it is the ticking I listen for. I don't want to become a deity. It holds the word die. I lay that summer down as a burnt offering. Its smell is of hair, ocean, and wild rosemary. I could let the whole island burn as if the dried graveled roads and beaches of nude bodies had their own summer apart from us. You were cruel and wise. I was nickels and beauty. I hear the sparrows still tidying their nests in the crooks of roofs. They were relentless. The sky never clouded over, not once. I don't trust the sky that won't rain. The rest of that year crawled to me as if out of hiding. Um, it's true, growing up in Florida, you get used to, you know, three o'clock rain <laughs> um, and then sunshine. <laughs> Sometimes rain and sunshine at the same time. <laughs> so uh, it's true, I don't trust the, the sky that doesn't rain. I need, I just, I'm used to that pattern anyway. Um, all right, let's see, listen. Like a hundred gray ears, the river stones are layered in a pile near the shed where morning doves slow their peck and bobble to listen to a chorus of listening. Small buds on the lilac perk up. 
a cardinal's torpedoed call comes in slow waves of four, round after round. It's a love call, a call to make him known to himself. The stones listen harder, decipher the song, attempt to offer back its echo, but fail. This is not a poem of coming spring. This is a poem well aware that gray flesh is dead flesh. All of the ripening, ripe listening comes at a cost. The first sky is in all skies. The first song is in all songs. And I'll read one more poem from um, my book. And this takes place um, in Hawk Mountain or near Hawk Mountain in Rochester, Vermont. With Major on Hawk Mountain. In the early evening, the sky blushes at our close attention. We can't take our eyes off of it as two morning doves lift and land near our empty feeder, paired for life. The male lilts a coo. His breast mirrors the pink above us. I begin to hum a song, something about icons and suitcases. Last summer, I collected the dead monarch that now rests like a medieval relic on the yellow paper on my desk. One wing is split in two, a female with thick coal veins and no black dot on the hind wings, like Tiffany glass, all fire and pitch. The milkweed she ate all summer turned her blood to poison for her predators. Now her wings are as brittle as book pages left in the rain, dried in the sun. The summer my previous husband took his life, I thought each monarch in our garden was a sign. Not so, dead is dead. The flesh mountains now look as if they want a short nap, might come to life later with the moonlight. Even the dove has quieted into his shared nest. Oh, let's see, checking time. Um, so I have these, I'm gonna, um, let's see, yeah. All right, here we go. So the first poem, um, this is, these are new, uh, these are newish. Um, it's titled The Fox. And I love foxes and I always get super, super excited when, when one crosses our path and, um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm somebody who just feels like everything's a sign. <laughs> I, it was true with the monarchs. The, I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't want to maybe admit that, but it's, you know, I feel so lucky when I get an encounter, I have an encounter like that, particularly with an animal like a fox or a moose, the coveted Vermont moose that I, you know, I was lucky enough to see uh, one while I was still living there um, regularly. So anyway, the fox. One Red fox crosses Route 100, skittering past our front tires, a few yards up another. We could be near or half a world from our home. Wheeling in our seats, we tried to catch a glimpse of these two fiery hymns, their chanting footsteps crossing the familiar spine of a road. I bless your ears and eyes, and remember last winter when we watched a fox span a snowy field pause, then call the other, as if with small bits of thunder. And it was then I asked myself, how should I live? The dead have no lovers, and I was young and dead until you swerved enough. Four young birch trees penciling the road sag, knowing that everything almost dies and then does. For what are our eyes? For what are our ears? Into whose mouth are we followed? That night, we are kept awake by the moon, following the mountain's ridge like the tracery of a child. In the morning, all the lines are erased. We have coffee, read the news, and see shards of red flashing across our screens. I have been um, lucky enough to hear some videos that people are sharing of the spring 
of the peepers that are already out despite, well, it's really warm up there, I guess now, but um, uh, one friend shared a video of uh, snow and peepers at the same time. And I was worried for the peepers, of course, because I don't know that they're, I don't know what they'll do if they're already kind of out and about and then it gets too cold, I'm not sure. I, 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 I was not a biologist, but I was worried for, for them. And I, I mentioned that in the, in, an, in the post and he felt that that was even a larger question. I was like, I'm worried for the peepers. And it wasn't just this, in that immediate moment, just the greater worry for amphibians and their sensitivity to um, climate change and such. So um, here's a poem titled Spring Peepers. I try to record their song, lifting from the pines and birches, one solitary note, shrill, then three, trill, trill, then 12 or 20 all at once, like a reunion of women at a kitchen table, my aunts and grandmothers with wine in hand and cigarettes bouncing to the syllables of the names in their stories, their ash flick of grief. Why is dusk so melancholy? A vesper of tree frogs begins with or without me. I often sit and watch the end of the day turn to steely gray. Those women each claim their widowhood. Like the X on the back of the peeper, we are all marked in one way or another. Maybe we carry a sign from birth, maybe from far away. Each woman in my family has buried a husband. In that line, I am the last. Bits of night begin to unravel as the song swells and slowly covers the sky. Uh, there's a bit of a theme here. Um, also animals. This is another one titled an animal or it's two, two mule deer. So between the fox, the peepers, the mule deer. And I also have another poem coming called Bubblelink. You can tell I um, was super into the natural world ever since I was a kid. Um, and so I love that it can play out in my work. So two mule deer. And it's a spilling title poem. So it goes right into the poem. Two mule deer walking past my window this morning. Female, I think, no antlers, as the day moon pressed like a faded thumbprint into the bare back of the Santa Cruz mountains and the meadow of wild rye and wand buckwheat rocked in the new light. All hide and eyes and hunger moving with caution and blaze. Is there a coming of good? As if their path was already decided, I watched them step into the day black tail tipped and wide eared. So much of what I want isn't even about me. Yesterday, a friend said the sight of deer means danger is clear. No coyote or mountain lions nearby. Still, I remember what it feels like to be a sidewalk, a sudden girl camped down at an all night party, fingered then dropped by a boy who will be dishonorably discharged from the army two years later. You know how it feels wanting to walk into the rain and disappear. While hiking, a photographer found two deer legs about 100 feet apart, cloven hooves and dew claws intact, adapted for fleeing predators, left by a hunter. We are only what we are. Don't pity me. A slight steam rises from the backs of the deer as they move past the black oaked edge into the white light, lifting their eyes to the tree line, then to my window, then to the sky, hooves striking the ground over and over like the syllables of a low staccato voice. Um, let's see what page this one's on. So I am gonna share my screen if that's okay, because the next poem, I have, and I've, I've never read some of these poems I've never read out loud and I thought if you, I always want to. Um, and this is an acrostic poem, which is a poem about visual art. And I thought it'd be nice if I could share the art with you and you could see that while I read the poem. Um, so let me just, <laughs> it'll take one second to do this. Um, okay, now you're seeing my manuscript I'm reading from. And here's, oh, you know what I just realized? I didn't print the poem out and 
I can't see my poem and share the screen with you at the same time. <laughs> well, maybe you can look at the, look at the, I, I should have printed that particular one out. I don't think I have a copy of it. Um, there's the art. It's by this artist, um, um, Hilma of Klint, and she had a show at the Guggenheim a couple of years back now with COVID. I'm trying to remember, I think it was either, I don't think it was 2019, but it might've been or 2018. I feel like time had just got really slippery in the last year or so. Um, and I'll read the poem anyway, but maybe I, I can't, like I said, I don't think I can show this. I'm just looking to see if there's any suggestions. 2018, yes, thank you. Um, but um, I do reference the yellow in this kind of like Trinity piece and some of these, these like very organic squiggly kind of lines are, are in it. And then she has this language. The thing of it was, is that she had this language that um, was her own. She had actually a translation for these, they, they look like they're in, in, in um, like a, a romantic language or man's language, but they're not. So that it looked like U's and W's, but they're really symbols that she, she had to use for translation. So um, I will stop sharing. And I'll come back to read it. And hopefully maybe that image can kind of, I thought it was gonna be all slick and, and be able to do that. And then I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, okay, so let me. Okay, let's get back to it. So it's called Dehoga, D-E-H-O-G-A. And it's, um, that's translated as the masters. And she was, she was a group of five women that um, were doing some seances. Um, this is early 1900s. And she's considered now the first artist of abstract art, which it was given, that title was given to Kandinsky for the longest time. And the art world, the art historian, art, art, the world of art history is really resistant to embracing that as this as, as changing that, that idea, but her work dates to before anybody else. So um, De Hoga, after Hilma of Klimt's, um, piece was so called the 10 largest, that's number seven. And practice your drawings. They are pictures of drench drenching waves of ether which await you one day when your ears and eyes can apprehend a higher summons. And that's from their, their journals. And um, when I say letters U and W, that's from her writing. One, we were watching. We watched so hard we might have gone blind. And we listened too. Furiously we listened. We began to listen to the listening. And then the yellow bloomed like a beautiful atomic bomb, a three-part Venn diagram, the Trinity identified and dressed in ballooning yellow blouses. You, the spiritual forces of life. You, everything in the world of spirit, truth, freedom, tranquility, the reality of light, sacred desire, rebirth, woman. In the dusk, we would call to each other's disembodied voices. We were girls under a full moon, the wolf moon or of cold January, our breaths a soul just beyond our lips. Like a lover, we would one day take in an inhale, a consuming. You, the bond between the God within us and the soul. W, to fight cunning and vanity. W, everything that could be called a burden. Woman. As a girl, I prayed to God, I would never get a period. W, unease, life's material struggle and battle. What are we without our bodies? Woman, part two, listen to the shift from the rain to snow, from wood to ash. The pale grass never finishes, reminding us to listen. The pale pink sky at sunrise reminds us to pay attention. The robins who spread their small fires up and into the hackberry reminds us to be aware. Three, I was happy with nothing and with everything, was envious of the dark coolness of the lake in my childhood backyard, bed littered with tightly closed paper pond shells, easily pried open with a small knife, which could split two cupped palms ready to receive the spirit and reveal the flesh inside. And of course, the pearly iridescent maker, the lake, a backdrop for this violence, this beauty, primordial pond, beyond the cattails and duckweed, moccasins thicker than leather belts, nested, spawned, live-born babies, black lines of fear and death and life, looped like cursive handwriting 
as if they had been told what it was I was listening for in my fistfuls of day. This woman, a shadow moving above the southern summer lake, digging for something to devour. And I need to end, so I'm gonna end um, with, I just realized time, I think that's about, I'm at my, at my time, yeah. Um, so I'll finish with one um, small poem about spring. And it's titled Spring. See how the breeze opens its arms to the young birch, keeps the mornings cool enough for fogged breath, but heats the day like convection. If it rains, you can bet the dead will applaud from six feet below. Everyone wants to be born again and again. These days swing like a pendulum between now and forever, between the nudity of trees and the sudden shock of yellow daffodils, their tiny six petaled trumpets proclaiming the coming of honeyed days. Clouds like bolts of rickrack lace cutting across the sky. My breath like a saved envelope of child's hair opening at night next to your deep breathing. All right, thank you. Thank you all. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you for being a wonderful, wonderful audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dee Dee. That was spectacular. <laughs> Major. Major Jackson is the author of five books of poetry, including The Absurd Man, Roll Deep, Holding Company, Hoops, I can't get them all fast enough, Hoops, Hoops, um, and Leaving Saturn, which won the Cave Canem Prize for first book of poetry. His edited volumes include Best American Poetry, 2019, Renga for Obama, and Library of America's County Cullen Collected Poems, a recipient of fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Major Jackson has been awarded a Pushcart Prize, a Whiting Writers Award, <clears throat> and has been honored by the Pew Fellowship in the Arts and the Witter Brenner Foundation in conjunction with the Library of Congress. Um, now where am I? He has published poems and essays in American Poetry Re Review, The New Yorker, Orion Magazine, Paris Review, Plowshares, Poetry, Poetry London, and Ziziva. Major Jackson now lives in Nashville, Tennessee, <clears throat> where he is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Chair in Humanities at Vanderbilt University. He serves as poetry editor of Harvard Review. Major's work spans the world in keen, unflinching observations of life. His new book, The Absurd Man, which came out last year right in time for our reading, um, and which was postponed by the pandemic. Major's books have always displayed a wide literary knowledge, erudite and cosmopolitan, but he's at ease as well on the basketball courts of his neighborhood in Pennsylvania. This book, The Absurd Man, seems to me to consider the experience of living still with an enviable ability to bring a whole scene into view in very few words, but now with a willingness to reveal a truth that, as he writes, a wind-cursed city lies behind my eyelids. The Absurd Man takes as order and inspiration The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. The poem I'm about to read is from a suite of poems and is preceded by a sentence from Camus that could serve as an ars poetica for major, which is a little bold of me to assert, but anyway. Um, Camus writes, I want to liberate my universe of its phantoms and to people it solely with flesh and blood truths whose presence I cannot deny. How many of us have the fortitude to endure the whole of what we experience with, as Camus writes, courage and reasoning? In The Absurd Man at 14, which I'm about to read, listen to the profound vulnerability at the end of this poem, 
claimed without defensiveness and listened to the way with cinematic juxtapositions of scene and feeling, Major evokes the situation and the awful insight. The Absurd Man at 14. After church in an empty parking lot one Sunday, facing the Schuylkill, my mother wept behind the steering wheel. My feet throbbed in a pair of Buster Browns I'd outgrown by a season as I looked out the window, Autumn performing its last dying. He punched her again. A woman called the house, some yelling, then us out the door leaving, the kitchen phone cord swinging. Morning light burnished the windshield. Her wet face made her holy. A lone sculler scissored the river, his silhouette a shadow in motion. I wanted to say something, but my eyes flamed wild as reddish orange leaves firing up the ground. His stony look as we left said he was tormentor and master. I let her cry and felt a new world of women grow around me. And when she reached for my hand, instinctively I pulled away, her mouth open to my fading, unbearable heart. Major. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you for that reading. And thank you for the introduction. And I've long had my eye on the loom since you first started. So it's such an honor um, to uh, be a guest uh, of the series with uh, Didi and grateful to you and Toad Stool Books Shop and uh, all of our friends who are here and, um, and all the wonderful people who are joining us is amazing thing about the uh, Zoom. Uh, we're everywhere, I guess, all at once. It's fascinating. Uh, so hi, everyone. So happy to see everyone. Fred, Meg, Kristen, Vasiliki, everyone, Tim. So honored that you're here and all, all of our friends. I'm going to read and try and be as elegant and sweet of a short reading on a Sunday afternoon as possible. And uh, we'll read three poems from, I said thing, right, about this. You're either Max Headroom or you are the virtual backdrop. It's one or the other. Okay. Um, I was introduced to forest bathing as a term about a decade ago, Shinri Yoku. The world is catching up. The Times even had an article about it last week, I think it was. The body's uncontested need to devour. An explanation. I am bathing again, burying my face into the great nations of moss. I am leaning in, smelling the emerald mountains and the little inhabitants crossing over rock-like boulders and tree trunks empire bit by bit. My nose must come to them like a probing spaceship causing a mighty eclipse. They speak in whispers but do not shriek when gazing into the dim landing bays of my cavernous thoughts. I am grazing like a Dionysian. I come not with religion. I come yearning for first spring and a thirst for spores pooling like mercenaries in the dark. The little gods of the forest live here. I want to ingest their verdant settlements until they carpet my captivities and convert my raptorial self into its own ecosystem, off into the green. The most beautiful man never performs hard labor. I am sure my grandfather, 
would be ashamed of my hands for they carry nothing and are soft as downy feathers. And I'm sure he'd look askance at my treasured collection of stemless wine glasses and fashionable ascots. I am sure he'd smirk at the sight of fresh cut flowers delivered at my door Tuesday afternoons when my silken thoughts make like schools of minnows and so too the cantatas filling my house and me paddling like a dog through the recitatives. So unaccustomed my hands to the shape and fill of a revolver or the wood shaving tools he kept in his tool belt like armaments. I'm sure he shake his head at my having paused beneath the fruit tree on a bicycle with a basket carrying a French baguette and a collection of Lorca's poetry angling for a woman's touch. If you'll agree with me just for a moment, it felt like 2020 was a elegiac age and it still feels slightly elegiac even though the landscape, political landscape has changed a bit. We still have our collective and global challenges. Uh, this book contains several elegies. I wanna read this one because I think some people in the room might know or have worked with uh, Derek Walcott as a student or laughed with him as uh, a friend or marveled at his work. And um, I have two students in the room. I'm gonna dedicate this to Stephanie Wobey and Lisa Kruger. In memory of Derek Alton Walcott, One, island traffic slows to a halt as screeching gulls reluctant to lift heavenward congregate like mourners in salt-crusted kelp. As, of, as the repellent news spreads to colder shores, Sir Derek is no more. Bandwidths clogged by streaming tributes carry the pitch of his voice, less so his lines, moored as they are to a fisherman's who strains in the Atlantic. Then hearing too drops his rod, the reel unspooling like memory till his gape mouth matches the same look in his wicker krill, that frozen shock, eyes marbling a different catch. Pomerac trees and sea grapes, in laurel sway, wrecked having lost one who heard their leaves rustic dialect as law, grasped their boughs as edict from the first garden that sowed faith, and believe he did, astonished at the bounty of light like Adam over Castries, Casamba's port of Spain, the solace of sonorous rains, clouds like hymns then eaten so grass ornate winds on high verandas carrying spirits who survived that vow sea crossing, who floated up in his stanzas the same souls as Sheil saw alive the ocean their coffin. Faith too in sunsets, horizons whose backlit job is to divide and spawn reflection, which was his pen's work reason twinned with delight, divining like a church sexton. Poetry is empty without discipline, without piety. He cautions somewhere, even his lesser rhymes amount to more than wrought praise, but amplify his poems as high prayer. So as to earn their wings above, pelicans move into tactical formation then fly low like jet fighters in honor of him, nature's mouth, their aerial salute and goodbye. Derek, each journey we make 
whether Homeric or not, follows the literal wake of some other craft's launch, meaning to sense the slightest motions in unmoving waters is half the apprentice's training before they oar out, careful to coast, breaking English's calm surface. What you admired in Eakins. In a conversation at some cafe, New Orleans, Philly, was how his rower seemed to listen to ripples on the school kill as much as to his breath, both silent on a speaking canvas. Gratitude made you intolerant of the rudeness of the avant-garde or any pronouncements of the new, for breathing is legacy and one's rhythm, though the blood's authentic transcription hymns us to ancestors like a pulse. This I fathom is what you meant when exalting the merits of a fellow poet. That man is at the center of language, at the center of the song. Yet a reader belongs to another age and likely to list our wrongs more than the strict triumphs of our verse often retreats like a vanished surf spoon frothing on a barren beach. The allure of an artist's works these days is measured by his ethics. Thus our books scrub clean rarely mention the shadowless dark that settles over a page like an empire's. Your nib like the eye of a moon flashed into sight, the source of Adam's barbaric cry. Departed from paradise, each nobody a sacrifice, debating whose lives matter. We're on a golden platter. Our eyes roll confused in hate from Ferguson to Kuwait, you, Maitre, gave in laughter, but also for the hereafter, an almost unbearable truth. We are the terrible history of warring births destined for darkest earth. So, as fiber optic lights bounce under oceans, our white pain codified as they are in fiber layered in Kevlar, we hear ourselves in you. Where time exhales us to stand lost as a single nation awaiting your revelations. A shirtless boy bark, brown as bark, gallops along shore, bareback and free on a horse until he fades, a shimmering, all that remains. Okay. New poems, please forgive me. Uh, I have, uh, I'll read uh, three more poems. Let me begin again. This takes its title from a um, fantastic poem by Philip Levine, whose name doesn't, should be mentioned more, I guess, <clears throat> particularly during these times. Let me begin again. Let me begin again as a quiet thought in the shape of a shell slowly examined by a brown child on a beach at dawn straining to see their future. Let me begin this time knowing the drumming in my dreams is me inheriting the earth, is morning lighting up the rivers. Let me burn my vanities, old music in the pines, sifters of scotch, a day moon like a signature of night. This time, let me circle the island of my fears only once, then live like a raging waterfall and grow a magnificent mustache. Let me not ever be the birdcage or the serrated blade or the empty season. Dear glacier, dear sea of stars, Dear leopards disintegrating at the outer limits of our greed, soon we will only encounter you 
and motivational tweets. Reader, I should have married you sooner. This time, let me not sleep like the prophet who believes he's seen infinity. Let me run at breakneck speeds toward sceneries of doubt. I have no more dress rehearsals to attend. Look closer, I am licking my lips. So some of what we realize is um, part of this pandemic is the great vulnerability of of our elders. And so I was, I wrote this poem thinking about um, um, hopefully all of these poems were written on the other side of 2021. Uh, so you'll hear it. You, this is me imagining um, post pandemic on park benches. Look, all across our cities and town squares, the elderly have returned. They are here to crater our cheeks. They are unrelenting with their care, having known evil in their time. They are here to shoo away the monsters. They smell like winter afternoons and breath mints. They used to show up at bus stops and other houses of worship. Now they appear before twilight, singing off key beneath our windows like shattered troubadours or on park benches near playgrounds in close proximity to the new arrivants. We mistake them for apparitions in gray, mizzling rain. They come in wheelchairs pushed by angels. Despite the threnody that is their breathing, they pinch our noses. They leave their horrors on the side of the road like bicycles growing thinner and thinner just to make room for us. Out of senior housing, elder care centers, senior living, living facilities, they speak like museums. We are awed by their open hearts, spouting out strong chords of tearful laughter. Okay. I said three, so I'm, I'm going to read one more and it will be this, um, it's just a two page poem called Winter Egg Clog. And uh, I have the great fortune of being part of a group along with Didi, uh, a group of folks who we occasionally do a five day run of writing poems and sharing at the end of the day. And, uh, I just worked on this one poem <laughs> the whole week and it's a sequence called, called Winter uh, Egg Clog. And um, again, as you can hear, I'm, I'm right at the end of the year waiting for something to happen, uh, some miracle to happen. <clears throat> Winter Egg Clog. In cities, overcoats turn everyone to philosophers. A cold wind weakens their arguments, yet a sidewalk like the margins of this white page carries the imprint of their silent mumblings. A sweatered hound modeling the latest fashion hastens faster than her owner to a lobby where a doorman thumbing the ambassadors with a fingerless glove almost waves. The sound of slush beneath tires frightens tourists checking in the plaza, less so on the drive from the airport, the already dark. So they forego afternoon tea for cocktails and cheerful gossip in the palm court. Second day, snow like death equalizes. A vacant lot in the Bronx is picturesque. Broken windows frosted over give the view of a shaking globe. A blizzard disfigures a rusted plow in a pasture the same rate as a desuvero. At the edge of another year, a squall arrives like an eraser. I think of Rousseau tonight, his carnival evening, and that startling couple costumed in a deep forest, contrasting 
the desolation of barren trees. A cold moon? No, ourselves. That is, this is the season to go unshaven or off somewhere warm if you have the wealth. Third day, uh, epigraph, an illumined interior suffering core. May, for everything, this be our one recompense. It's the loftiest gem of all earthly gemstones and to carry it home undefiled. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. One feels the ache at the core of one's bones like a throbbing ghost in the machine. Package winds from the polar vortex. I love how winter cast us in our private zones at bus stops, by a fireplace, and cafe storefronts, each gaze soft as a statue. Who's to say? Maybe winter is more than mere allegory for death or Demeter's pain or the old cliche of Russia. The gulag in Siberia may have killed the esprit of its dissidents, but too gave the world rankless poets, which is every commuter on a corner, gently staring as if to summer inner light on days of darkness. Fourth day. We especially wanted it to happen, a bonfire by a pond on the last day in a year of contagion, the flickering conversations lit from a pyre of cedar crackling like a nation, arrested by the sheer presence in the dark of mass neighbors. We strained six feet, more or less to hear survival tales, the arc of our collective journeys home offices replete with baby cribs, long walks, daily cocktails, prayers. Even our dogs seem fed by our exuberant eyes. We saw our richness pulsing in flaming embers, all of us awaiting the miraculous birth of a new year. Thank you, everyone. And we are so lucky to have you too. Thank you. And to have all of you. Does anyone, um, I know it's hard to sort of speak after you've heard a lot of, a lot of words, but does anyone uh, have something in particular you'd like to hear Major or Didi talk about or both of them? I'm just looking to see if anyone's raising a hand or anything. I mean, I have something to start us off with. Um, Major, I, my, I, have a, I was thinking this morning, when did you come up with the absurd man, the Camus thing as an organizing principle? Was that, did you start with that or did it emerge as you went or what? Combination of both. Uh, thank you for that question, Rebecca. Um, well, as you know, Didi's, um, first husband or previous husband, I should say, um, self-harmed. Um, and Camus, the myth of Sisyphus, was a huge, huge uh, discovery at a young age. I, I think it freed me intellectually hmm. and also, um, also had me generally kind of consider and face um, what were prior to them uh, private moments. <laughs> um, the, the big looming question of why are we all here and what is purpose and um, isn't it absurd? And at some point I realized in putting the poem together, I mean, the book together, that um, the the guiding uh, Greek myth, myth uh, Sisyphus, we are every time we sit down to write a poem, we're beginning mm -hmm. at the base of that mountain again. And uh, I think had uh, Camus had a couple more chapters 
<laughs> among his examples, he would have included the poet. He does write about the writer, um, the playwright, the conqueror, um, even a politician, but the, the poet shares some space in confronting um, confronting reality and, and what appears to be in the universe, a very, very uh, strained, <laughs> veiled, uh, illogical existence. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. And um, Dee Dee, I have a question for you too. I would, uh, th there's this line in um, Duccio's Annunciation in your book, which is um, Gabriel folding two coffee colored wings into themselves. I just love that. And I love how um, visual it is. And I noticed that in a lot of your work, there's this, you paint, you paint the picture. <clears throat> and I don't, I, I mean, this is kind of a weird question, but I don't know whether you, you see the image first, or if you discover the the look of it as you're writing it, or if you even know what you do first and um, second. Yeah, well, um, art, art, visual art plays a large role in my writing. Um, and my students know this, I've told them this, and it, this just works for me. Uh, I often see art as poetry and poetry as art. And what I mean by that is I, an image that I'm trying to make work on in the line becomes something that I studied or taught in art history because I taught art history for so many years. And so much so that I can even, I was just doing it today too. Like I was on Instagram um, and I was flipping through and there was a poet on there and I was like, oh yeah, her work is like, and I was thinking, so I automatically associate Po poetry, particular types of styles of poetry to styles of art, and mostly all it's contemporary. I'm talking like contemporary poetry and contem contemporary art. It was Carolee Schneeman. <laughs> so I'll let you guess the poet who I was <laughs> thinking was like Carolee Schneeman. Anyway, um, but yeah, that I was that piece by Duccio, and I apologize if you guys can hear barking, that's our, our um, young little puppy guy downstairs. Uh, I think seeing people go across in front of the house. Um, but the coffee colored wings, I just thought it was fascinating because normally, particularly during the time Renaissance, painters were painting wings of the angels in these really gorgeous, elaborate colors. Like they were like rainbow colors. Because the thing about heaven is that you can imagine anything, anything, it can be absolutely beautiful, right? And so for the Duccio to paint that uh, Gabriel's wings in this coffee color, I think he was, it was during a time when he was trying to move into more like realistic or believable the natural world became the part of an observer he was kind of like an early renaissance early time renaissance artist just coming out of the gothic period where everything was heavenly and so maybe he was like wings are brown birds have brown wings you know mostly and so i'm gonna make do, gabriel's he has wings they're gonna look like birds wings you know i don't know so i did find that fascinating um and i was fascinated with the idea of the messenger it's true um because I was like, you know, who gets to go get this kind of big news? What kind of news do people get and give? And even when it wasn't, it wasn't exact, but even when my husband, um, when he died, I had to give that news to people too. I had to become the messenger of this really horrible, this horrible information. And I never want, even when I started, first started writing my poems and even reading these poems out loud, I felt like I'm this messenger. Like I, that's why I situated Science for the Living is my first poem. It's my proem of my book. It's before all the poems because I feel like it gives context and it, it lets the reader know it's coming in a way because I too became very worried about being the bearer of bad news, you know? Um, and so Gabriel was fascinating to me. I always used to teach my students in art history, the two archangels, Gabriel, Michael, one's the, one's the announcer and one's the bouncer. <laughs> so like Gabriel announces, and Michael bounces. He's the bouncer, like the, the guard to the entrance to heaven. Like not everybody gets in, you know, like the bouncer at the, at the beginning of an entry to a club, you know. Um, anyway, so yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know like if that image, I think the image is there. And I think I want to, I want to talk about that because there's just some pieces of art I just like, you know, get like stuck. And I just, I love visual art so, 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 so much. 
Yeah. Other people? There is a question in the chat room that's from Jimmy Papas. He's asking, what is your favorite County Cullen poem for major? Yet do I marvel. <laughs> it's a gorgeous sonnet. Uh, if you remember, I doubt that God is good, well-meaning and kind. And should he stoop to quibble, um, he could explain why in this perfect, perfect sonnet. Uh, a poem again where Sisyphus comes up it, so does Tantalus uh, but Sisyphus comes up doomed uh, doomed to a never-ending stare he says but he asks that question of course at the end yet do I marvel at this curious thing to make a poet black and bid him sing and so now I'm 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 really uh, acknowledging how unoriginal I am uh, <laughs> I truly stole the idea from County Cullen. Um, yeah, it, it's it's that 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 contradiction, that duality that we that we talk about, double consciousness. Um, that's that's the that is the poetic uh, corollary to Du Bois's notion of double consciousness, and it's been a again. I I just use the word with Jimmy in a private chat, but it's a freeing, it's freeing. Some metaphors are freeing in the sense that they unlock and open up um, consciousness um, and existence and ways of kind of living and understanding the world around us. And uh, early encounter with, uh, with uh, County Cullen's poem, Yet Do I Marvel, among, um, among many of his poem, Heritage being one of them, um, he was probably, in my mind, uh, the most kind of Virgoan, Virgo-like uh, <laughs> poet of his era. I mean, he counted his syllables, his meters mm. were perfect. They called him the Black Keats, um, uh, but I think he wanted to out Keats Keats at times. Mm. You know, if you read that poem, you'll you'll feel the that argument truly on display in that sonnet is the is the argument of the sonnet it's yeah. extraordinary um, I, I want to give a plug for this for the um, best poetry collection of 2019 that major um, edited I mean not edited what's the right word you're right <laughs> chose chose the poem yeah, the poems chose, are yeah. really different kinds of poems than what usually appears in this series they're very fresh and present and and you'll meet a lot of new poets so thank you rebecca for that there is another question from kristen fogdahl dd could you reflect on the birds that appear in your poems do they tend to arrive for particular purposes i um yes i mean i don't know if they arrive for particular purposes um poop on I, I do not poop on my head. <laughs> metaphorically, they, of course. Metaphorically, yeah, they give me their, I have been interested, again, in the natural world, um, and I didn't get, I was watching my time, I was trying to, and I didn't get to the bubbling poem. Um, the natural world has just been so important to me um, since I was a kid. I mean, the, the poem I read about the lake, it was one of the first things I would do at living in Florida in very day. I mean, was, I always joke, I'm a kid of the seventies because my parents were like, okay, go out and just be outside and till, till dusk. And I'm going by the lake, there's moccasins, alligators, you know, it's Florida. So it's like, everything's deadly. Fire ants, I have poems about fire ants too. I just loved it. It was just, I, I just loved it. And so that love for the natural world has just stayed with me uh, all my life. Um, and birds, somebody posted also, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm referencing social media. I swear I'm not like, I don't live on social media, but someone posted an article um, about be, seeing birds brings as much satisfaction as money, like getting money. Like it was like the study that they did about like, where, where are you happier? And to see, a, see birds equals the happiness of maybe wealth in some way or something, I don't know. But um and I think birds are, are, are an easy way to identify or connect with the natural world because they can, I, I literally can look out right, right out my window and I'll see a handful. I see 
titmice and I see the purple finch and then robins and the mockingbirds here. And I was obsessed with new, learning the new birds in Vermont, like the chickadee shows up all the time in my poems because I didn't have chickadees growing up. And there's this really amazing common bird that they're just so industrious. So I don't know, they don't really have necessarily any, they do take on roles. And that's the other thing I was gonna say when we were talking about um, art in my work, the thing is not the natural world kind of takes on a metaphorical role in my work as well. Um, and, but often it's just me seeing it and it sparks like this, I wanna write about it, I wanna record it. And I wouldn't call my, I mean, it's like, there's some arguments about what's, a, what's an environmental poet? What does that mean to be an environmental poet? Um, and part of me is just the idea of re the recording of the thing, just the recording of, of what we're seeing, just to record it is an, and it's an act of uh, protest or an act of um, awareness for the environment. Um, yeah, the, the bobolink. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a perfect segue. Why don't we end with the bobolink? Oh, okay. I'd be happy to. Okay. Oh, that's great. It's um, well, and also it's because I was going to say about the bobolink is. Um, University of Vermont has this initiative where they're trying to help farmers, subsidize farmers to um, not cut their fields during the time period of nesting. And mm -hmm. so it became an endangered, it became an endangered because of the farming practices and how we sped everything up. It's not like the old days where you would cut maybe just once, I guess, and they're cutting multiple times. So the bobolink was suffering because they make their nests in those spaces. Um, so that's, that's uh, really interesting. Let me see that, get what page it's on. Let me get it up, sorry. It's up at the front, so I'll get, I'll find it one sec. Okay, bobolink. In a meadow as wide as a wound, I thought to stop and study the lesser stitch warts, white flowers, lacing up boot level grasses. When I was scolded in song by a black and white bird, whose wings sipped air, swallow light, until he landed on the highest tip of yellow dock, still singing his beautiful warning, the brown female with him in fear. The warning was real, the anniversary of my husband's suicide. What, what was the matter with life? Sometimes when the wind blows, the meadow moves like an ocean. And on that day, I was in its wake. I mean the day in the meadow. I mean the day he died. This is not another suicide poem. This is a poem about a bird I wanted to know. And so I spent that evening looking up his feathers and flight, spent most of the night searching for mating habits and how to describe the yellow nape of his neck like a bit of Gothic stained glass or the warm brown females with a dark eye line. How could I have known like so many species, they too are endangered. God must be exhausted. Those who choose life, those who choose death. That day I braided a few strips of Timothy hay as I waited for the pair to move again, to lift from the field and what, live? The dead can take a brother, a sister, not really. The dead have no one. Here in this field, I worried the mowers like a giant gorging, like giant gorging mouths would soon begin again and everything would be as it will. Thank you. Thank you. What was the name major of that hike where that meadow was? It's out in, um, oh man, I can't remember. It was a hike in Vermont we went. It's, it was on the anniversary of my, it was we were out there in my, I was trying to remember. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Major and Didi. Thank, thank you, you Rebecca. See you next time. And thank you everyone. Bye.